Okay, hi everybody. Welcome, I'm Mimi um, and I'm here on behalf of the Dharma Collective and I'm very appreciative that they um, opened this up for teachers to offer a course. Um, there's so much going on right now, it's incredibly complex and um, it couldn't be a better time to have uh, this class, I think. So really appreciate the efforts that you guys have put into it. Um, so I'd love it if you guys could pull up a link that I'll be referring to off and on and then hopefully towards the end, we'll have some time to uh, just, you know, for me to point out a few things on that. Um, so I think that Noam or Katie has put that link in the chat or if they could, or can I put it in? Oh, I do have the, okay, let me do that. I can do that. I didn't know if I would be able to do it um, sometimes, um, okay. But we can all do it. It's a collective, collective. Oh, and look, we did. <laughs> That's very impressive. <laughs> okay. Um, so an overview of what I'd like to do today is, um, first I want to meditate and get embodied. Um, so we'll do a little embodiment exercise and, um, and then I'll do an abbreviated Satipatthana um, mindfulness practice just to really get us in there. Um, I won't go through all of the four um, contemplations, but um, again, I just want to bring us into the space to start thinking about mindfulness and to really connect to what's going on um, right now. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about binarism and what that is and why I am interested in that term versus dualism. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about practices that um, we can use to harmonize inner and outer worlds. Um, one, of course, is metta, right? And then the second is satipatthana. Um, I won't talk too much about that. Um, it's a whole course in and of itself. Um, but I'll talk about clear comprehension and how that can really buttress what your mindfulness practice is. They really go together. Um, and also um, talk a little bit um, about my interests right now, because that's really what kind of drove me to want to um, participate in this series, and that is um, structural racism. I'm very interested in kind of um, opening myself up as a white person who grew up in the South and has lived in different parts of the country um, to understand a little bit more about that. And so I thought I would share some of the resources um, that I have come across because I think that um, whatever issue it is, and hopefully you're not trying to conquer all of the issues <laughs> because there are so many right now, um, whatever the issue is, I think um, part of harmonizing inner and outer worlds so that you can take wise action is educating yourself, right? Is really thoroughly educating yourself about the issues. So that's what I've been trying to do. Um, and I'll share some of those resources with you. And then possibly maybe we could propose some future gatherings that are wrapped around um, the issue of structural racism if uh, the Dharma Collective is open to that. You know, you guys will have to give them feedback and let them know. I'm certainly interested in being part of something like that. Um, and then I'll close with uh, Ruth King's uh, equanimity meditation. So hopefully there's time to get through all of this stuff. I'll try to be, um, my issue is that I always pack too much in a class. <laughs> I'll just let, lay that out there right now. And I want you to feel comfortable offering anything that you have to add or another dimension of what I'm talking about to contribute to the class. So I'm very open to that. And of course, any questions, if I can answer them, I will do my best. So, um, so why don't we start with a meditation and an embodiment exercise. So go ahead and make yourself comfortable and close your eyes. And as you're closing your eyes, I want you to consider yourself to be a lotus and that you're just softly closing the petals of your body, but you're leaving space between the petals, right? You're not closing so tightly that there's no space there. You're allowing yourself to be spacious, yet you're turning inward 
but you're not completely closing out the outer world here. Good. Just take a nice deep breath. Good. I'd like to start with just a really simple exercise to access your diaphragmatic breathing. So we're just going to take a really simple twist with the eyes closed. Just uh, whether you're uh, sitting cross-legged or seated, go ahead and just take a very simple twist to your right. So you can take your left hand to the outside of your thigh or knee. See that your spine is very long. Your pelvis is neutral so that your spine can easily rise out of it. Feel the crown of the hand, head ascending. And the diaphragm is at the base of the ribs. So I want you to feel as you inhale that gentle pressure that moves downward towards the organs of digestion. And as you exhale, feel the diaphragm rising gracefully, just putting light pressure on the bottoms of the lungs, helping you exhale. Good, inhale. And exhale. One more in this twist, inhale. And exhale. Beautiful. And just return to center. See if you can access that same knowledge, that same view of the diaphragm, even when you're not in a twist. It's not quite as strongly apparent, but see if you can feel that movement up and down of the diaphragm. Good. Now just a gentle twist to your left. The right hand will come to the outside of the left leg, thigh or knee, wherever it's accessible for you. And find that long spine so you're not tilting forward or back. Big inhale, again, finding the diaphragm moving downward, just that gentle pressure downwards. And then as you exhale, feel it moving upwards towards the lungs into the rib cage. Good, inhale. And exhale. One more like that, inhale. And exhale. Good, very slowly return to center. Good. And a few breaths here again, just to still find the diaphragm. So important to have access to this in your own body. This is where we hold a lot of tension. A lot of anxiety can come from this part of the body. So finding that diaphragm and taking some deep breaths and really feeling that beautiful, elegant movement upwards and downwards can just help release tension. Good. Focusing now on the energy body, we're going to just go through the five values, which are winds that move the energy about the body. And it is thought in ancient yogic wisdom that it is moving between the space of the leaves of a lotus. If you are a lotus, this is where your energy resides. So you want to keep nice and open. Good. So first we'll look at our downward energy, our descending energy of the apana vayu. So as you breathe and you feel that diaphragm, just notice when you feel downward energy and you might just consider 
exhaling a little bit longer than the inhale. So we'll just do this for a few breaths, downward energy. This is your connection to the earth. Good. Now let's look at the centering energy of the Samana Vayu. And this is located right at your navel center. So you might feel a sense of gathering of upward and downward energies here. As you breathe, your inhalations and exhalations can be equal in duration. Good. And then the pranavayu, which is at the heart center, regulating inward movement of energy. So it's related to assimilation and, of course, heart energy. So as you do this, feel the chest expanding and contrasting with the contraction. It's drawing inward and the expanding energy of the heart. Good. And our ascending energy of Udana Vayu, which is located at the throat center, the fifth chakra. Feel your ascending energy. You can increase the length of your inhalations and notice how energizing this is. Good. And lastly, Viana Vayu, which is radiating energy. And I always imagine it radiating from my heart center outward towards the distal ends of my body, hands and feet, crown of head, and then outward even from there beyond my body to others. Beautiful. Okay. Feel the whole body at once. Move into the first body contemplation of Satipatthana. And as you feel the whole body at once, contemplate skin, flesh, and bones. Consider that all the people that have come before you, every single one of them has had skin, flesh, and bones. Everyone now living at the same time as you also have skin, flesh, and bones. And all the people in the future that come after you And as you consider and contemplate these three qualities of your anatomy, notice how and where you feel them. And you can do this as a body scan, or you can just notice what comes first and let your, your eyes, your inner eyes, just move around the body freely. as you contemplate skin, flesh, and bones, 
do this with a sense of non-attachment, it's just skin, flesh, and bones. Good. Consider the elements of earth, water, fire, and air, and that you contain the qualities of those four elements, and that everything outside of you also contains those four elements. Everything that you ingest contains those four elements. The qualities of the elements are pervasive. Consider, consider the qualities of the elements, solidity of earth, fluidity of water, the temperature of fire, and the movement of air. Notice where you feel these in your body. Good. Now turn towards the breath. Without changing your breath, just let it be very natural and easeful. Consider all of the living things that breathe and that we share this activity with them. Consider that the breath is what connects us to life all of our experiences in our life and it connects us to death. On your inhalations, consider that it could be your last breath. We don't know when we will die. And as you take those inhalations, Feel that energizing quality. Notice where you feel the inhalation. And as you exhale, exhale consider the quality of letting go. That sense of release. Notice the pause after the exhale. Notice how your breath is changing all the time.
Good. Now reconnect to the whole body at once if you've lost that connection. Just for the next few breaths, feel the whole body. Good. Notice that there are pleasant, unpleasant and neutral feelings in the body. These are not emotions. This is just a general hedonic tone of the body. So general feeling sense. For the next few minutes, notice where you feel pleasant sensations, where you feel unpleasant sensations, and where you feel neutral sensations. Notice that they too are changing. Notice that you may not know if something is pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. And that's okay. Now turn towards the mind and notice the feeling tone of the mind. Is it pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? This isn't about the content. Again, it's just about a general tone, a general sense. Good. Now looking a, more, a little bit more deeply at the mind, notice if any of the defilements are present. Greed, hatred, delusion. On the surface level. But more importantly, notice when they are not present. And when they're not present, notice how pleasant that is. That there's a subtle sense of joy in the absence of the defilements.
Good. And now just move into a sense of open awareness for the remainder of the meditation. Finding joy when the defilements aren't present. And just enjoying the space that you've created for yourself here. This knowledge, this understanding, this connection to yourself.
And just check in to see if your lotus paddles still are in a spacious position. You haven't closed in too much. You haven't shut up your sense of awareness of what is around you and the people that you're meditating with. Good. And in preparation for the meditations and go ahead and begin to feel your lotus petals beginning to open. Welcome back. So uh, just to point out that um, I have a link to um, a wonderful video on how the diaphragm works and where it's located. I teach a lot of people breathing and I talk about the diaphragm and often people will say, where's the diaphragm? So I always try to uh, pass this along. Um, it's a very helpful video um, that you can look at at some point. And then also just a diagram of the winds. This is from Ayurveda and yoga. I'm sure Jenny's seen something like this before. Um, it's just a really nice way of thinking about energy and how it's moving around your body and where you may feel blocked and how you can kind of work with that. So that is just a, uh, a reference for you. Um, the Lotus reference um, is also something, as I said, from, from ancient yoga, uh, where they did actually believe that um, if you're a Lotus, your heart is at the center of the Lotus, of course, and that the energy moves between the petals and you don't wanna close it up too much, right? Um, and also from Analio's Satipatthana practice, he uses this beautiful metaphor of, you know, on and off the cushion when you're on, you're a lotus, right? But when you're on the cushion, your petals are closed, right? You're moving inward. And when you're off the cushion, you're a blossoming lotus, very open. So I always find that a really beautiful thing to think about. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, binarism and why I want to use this idea of the binary. Um, and um, it comes from post-structuralist theory and criticism um, where uh, especially um, radical feminist critique and also some uh, theories about race um, and gender um, in particular. And I came across these often in art. Um, I'm an artist and have a graduate degree and read a bunch of this stuff. And it has come back around in my research on structural racism because it suggests that this sort of seeming up opposition of two forces that seem somewhat stable isn't sufficient to describe difference, right? It's just not sufficient. Um, and uh, dualism is very similar, but it comes out of, um, philosophy and modernism with Descartes and its 
from Cartesian dualism. And it's still a fine term to use and you can still use it to describe uh, you know, two opposing forces. But I just find that um, for me in my practice when I'm searching for ways to practice and I'm searching for ways to work with my practice, this idea of finding more ways to describe difference and nuance is much more helpful for me. So that's why I'm using it here. Um, and then I also like to define spectrum for you. And I'll just, re I thought this was a really good um, definition that I found. Um, and it says a broad range of varied but related ideas or objects, the individual features of which tend to overlap so as to form a continuum, right? So it's different than a gradation, right? Which we often think of. Um, and if you, again, look at the resources, you can see the difference between a spectrum and a gradation. And I'm, again, being an artist, I'm always looking for visual representations of our experience. Um, and you can see in a spectrum, you know, each color is affected by the color it's adjacent to, right? And it moves up and down the spectrum based on that. Whereas a gradation, is just different intensities or saturation of a color. So you can use gradation to describe experiences in your meditation practice, of course, um, and experiences in the outer world, such as, you know, perhaps the intensity of your anger or an emotion, right? Um, but I find that a spectrum is more representative of reality and our experience. Um, and then the last sort of color theory idea I'm going to plant for you here is below that Joseph Albers, who was the founder of the Black Mountain College in North Carolina mid-century and, you know, architects and dancers, choreographers, artists, um, all, you know, went there was this real nexus of um, thought, right? This is such an amazing example of how context has such a huge effect on things, right? And this is just a visual representation, but you'll begin to notice that context is really everything in all of your experiences. It can help you take wise action. You need to know what the context is, regardless of what kind of action you're taking, okay? So just wanted to posit those ideas. Um, so let's talk about some common binaries. Does anybody have one in mind that you'd like to offer? Good and evil. Yeah, okay, that's a good one. Now that comes from Cartesian dualism and you know religion. And um, the thing that's really interesting about that, I'll use good and bad, I'll change it to good and bad. Um, one of the things that um, a woman that I've Come, become very familiar with lately, uh, Robin DiAngelo, who has written, uh, written a book recently called White Fragility. It's a fantastic book. Um, and she does all kinds of trainings um, to help people understand race and um, how they can uh, transform their businesses and education centers, and etc. Anyway, she talks about this binary being really um, reinforcing in a way of um, our structural racism in that we automatically assume that a person is bad, right, if they're a racist. And we automatically assume a person is good if they're anti-racist, right, which just isn't true. Um, so just something to consider. And, you know, we're not going to go into that. I highly recommend that you read her book, but that's just how these binarisms. Now, you can also take that into the, the way you talk about your meditation practice. How useful is it if you say, well, I had a bad meditation, <laughs> right? Or I had a good meditation. Um, and they feed into, you can just see right there, they feed into one another, right? You begin to compare things, right? Good and bad. And um, one of the things I love that Chula Dasa has said and, and other people, and he's been one of my teachers, um, is that the only bad meditation is the one that you did not do. <laughs> and I totally agree with that. So, um, so you can see how that can really, uh, in both cases. Now, the dualism of um, black and white, right? Sometimes we use that term to mean clarity. Right. But now, of course, with um, what's going on in the world with Black 
lives matter this you know it's really come to the foreground it's always been there um, one of the things that Robin D'Angelo points out is that um, these terms white and black didn't exist before slavery right so white needed black in order to support its position of dominance so that's a really interesting thing to look at and you can also probably find uh, the binaries of your meditation practice can also begin to reinforce one another and you kind of get into a rut with that right um, where you cling to the idea of these extremes and it prevents you from making progress in your practice so who can think of some other binaries? Gender. Yeah. Great Healthy example. Amount. Yeah. And we know that, that things are not as clear cut as have been presented, right, in the past. And so this is where, um, you know, uh, how we identify uh, ourselves can be completely different than what is socially constructed. And you can also see how all of these are constructions, right? Um, how we fabricate these things in order to reinforce, such as the binary of black and white, such as the binary of male and female. It kind of fed into a whole system of being, of law, of, you know, everything that um we're religion many many things that we are um exposed to in our social being uh anything else i just think it's really good to think about to be aware of these binaries i have a whole list so i'm just hoping that you guys <laughs> me and outside yeah uh, well, let's just acknowledge that inside and outside, right? So that you could also think about um, relative to your meditation practice, right? This idea that on the cushion and off the cushion are two separate things. And what we're really trying to do is to create a continuum, right? So that they become a spectrum of experience. One influences the other. Um, and this is one of the things I think that the Satipatthana practice deals with so well, and other practices as well, but it's, its goal is to do that. So, um, yes, and what did you um, say, Daniel? Liberal and conservative. Oh, fantastic, yeah. And we know there's a whole spectrum where, um, you know, maybe the extreme left and the extreme right kind of meet sometimes <laughs> in certain respects yeah so you could see if you saw a spectrum like in a circle you could begin to very clearly begin to see how um there are many shades in there of um difference so that's great thanks for those examples i'm trying to think of some others here let's see i have one of the ones i love is mind wandering and not mind wandering <laughs> right so when we judge our meditation practice this way, it really limits us, right? If we don't see the spectrum of our experience. Um, because if you just say you're mind wandering and you don't see that maybe it's improved, right? That it's not quite as much as it used to be, then you're just going to be judging your meditation all the way down the line. So beginning to see the subtleties in that uh, and the kind of, the paradox within that of the more mindful you become in your meditation practice, the more you see, and it might even seem like there's more thought present when in fact it's just that you've like refined your ability to see more clearly. So, you know, there's some, some ruts you can get into with that. Um, another one is um, the push and pull of craving and desire right there's most certainly a spectrum relative to that but um sometimes it's hard to see sometimes it's very hard to see uh right and wrong and i love tig's uh comment in his presentation about really appreciating your entitling this wise action versus right action 
because I think it does immediately like put us in this place of right and wrong. So I really appreciated that. Um, and then uh, I'll say another thing about um, black and white in my notes. I um, Ta Nahasi Coates um, has a wonderful uh, statement in his book Between the World and Me, where he says that race is the child of racism. So this this relates to D'Angelo's um, uh, comment about white needed black, right? So the idea of race really wasn't present before, again, before slavery. And so um, his comment that race is the child of racism, not the father, is very poignant, I think. Um, so why, why do we fall into these binaries? Why do you think that is? Security. Yeah, we need certainty. Certainty is comfortable, right? And this is why uh, understanding and permanence is so difficult at first. And then it's very liberating once you realize that things are, you know, always changing. Um, so there's comfort and recognition. We're really sure about something. And this also is a result of um, Cartesian dualism and. If you guys are interested, Rob Berbea has some wonderful talks. I didn't have a chance to put it in this resource list, but I will. Um, he has some wonderful talks on um, uh, questioning awakening and also Buddhism after modernism um, and how the, the need for truth, right, of modernist philosophy and how that's affect Buddhism, which is really interesting. Um, the thing that Ruth King, uh, King talks about that I love is she calls them perceptual knots. And she doesn't refer necessarily to the binary, but she talks about perceptual knots. And I think that we get into perceptual knots with binaries. And this is the rut I was referring to previously. We can get into these perceptual knots in our practice and also in our perception of the outer world and how we relate to it. So often when that happens, it's because we've fallen into some sort of binary situation or dualistic situation. So what's the big one in Buddhism? What's the big binary in Buddhism? There are two, really. You could describe them in two different ways. There's Nibbana, not Nibbana. How about self and other? <laughs> How about subject and object? Yeah, yeah which relates to what you're talking about, right? It's the same thing. Um, so yeah, those are really drastic kinds of binaries that we're trying to come to some sort of resolution with. So, um, and I think too, another reason, especially in English, we fall into it because of the difficulty of language. Um, now I don't speak Japanese, but I've heard a rumor that there's like, you know, 30 words for snow. Right? We don't have that in our language. It's very limiting. Um, and I'm not sure about, you know, if Japanese culture embraces a spectrum more than a binary. I'm not really sure, but their language seems to do so. So I think there's a difficulty of language always in this when we're trying to describe things. We tend to sort of just move to those extremes. So how do we meet division with wise action? How do we do that without falling into these patterns? And I think that the way we do it is with our practice and um, harmonizing the internal and external worlds. And one thing that I heard recently in the Robert Bea talk was that, um, you know, in his research of the Pali language, when the word samadhi was originally posited by the Buddha, it didn't mean concentration, right? It meant harmonizing and it meant agreement and unification. And sometimes you do hear people use those terms, but mostly when you hear the word samadhi, you think concentration, which is a very limiting kind of way of thinking about that. So I'm suggesting that this harmonizing of inner and outer worlds is a type of samadhi. Why not open up our ideas about that word? Why not think about this inner and outer world thing as this sort of 
movement towards unification too. And some of you may already think that, and, um, but it's a really beautiful way of thinking about it and thinking about our practice. And the other way that we meet division is by educating ourselves about whatever subject is upsetting us, is causing us to have anxiety, whether it's you know structural racism, whether it's politics, whether it's um, um, you know gender, whether it's whatever it is, educate yourself as much as possible. And you know I'm speaking for myself here, but I know as a white person of privilege, I have ridden the coats of structural racism most of my life, unwittingly, but really? <laughs> I ask myself, really? Um, and it's been um, just profound to like really, really, really dig into um, trying to educate myself more and more about the subject. So um, whatever it is for you, educate yourself about it as much as you can. So practices, of course, metta. Um, Ruth King says that racism is a disease of the heart. And, but the good news is, she says, it can be fixed, right? So I love that. It can be fixed. In her book, Mindful of Race, she talks a lot about this. It's a, a really beautiful read. Um, mindfulness, of course, and she calls that heart surgery. <laughs> it's like heart surgery, which is fantastic. And mindfulness, of course, the Satipatthana is the foundation of mindfulness. And I highly recommend that it's one of the tools that you have in your toolbox, right? I'm not going to talk too much about it. It's a whole course. Um, but basically, we practiced um, the Satipatthana. I think Analio's um, practice guide that he just recently published, I think in 2015, I guess it's not so recent now, 2015, time flies, um, is a wonderful guide. And he also offers, offers a course that you can take. Um, and sometimes I teach it as well. Um, and many, many other teachers are offering this. And it's just a really good foundation to have. It's something that you can always come back to. And I find also that it blends the inner and outer worlds pretty well because all of those practices you can take off the cushion and so and metta as well one of the most profound practices that i've taken on is to do metta when i'm walking down the sidewalk and it just immediately brings up any prejudice that you have around anything not just race not just you know perhaps gender or any of the sort of the real pulsing issues right now, but just the little ones like, I don't like that hat or whatever it is. And it'll just be like the first thing that comes to your mind. And you're just like, Whoa, I didn't even know that was in there, you know? Um, because you're really trying to connect with people silently. Of course, you're not like tipping your hat and saying filled with loving kindness. <laughs> you're not saying that you're just, silently experiencing this, trying to radiate loving kindness to people, and it's a very profound practice. Well, the same for Satipatthana. You can do all of the practices off the mat um, and kind of get a feel, for, perhaps, for your hedonic tone as you're walking to work. And then you can perhaps notice how that affects your behavior, right? And you begin to make connections and all of a sudden you're in the realm of dependent origination, right? So it can really deepen your understanding of all of the practices of um, Buddhism that are so helpful in meditation. So um, another thing to really connect to is clear comprehension. Does everybody understand clear comprehension? Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say four things know what you're doing, <laughs> know why you're doing it, know who it's going to affect, and know the context in which you're doing it. Know the context. And I would say context is one of the most important aspects of that. And that's where your mindfulness practice and your awareness comes in handy. Um, Analeo calls it the wide angle lens, right? It's very broad. In every situation, you try to have this wide angle lens. Um, Ruth King says, see the constellation and not the stars. 
see the constellation of the stars. It's really easy to just see the sparkles of whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, and then of course the color example by Albers, right? Everything is context, everything is context. And then Marilyn Fry, who is a scholar, um, and Robin D'Angelo refers to her in um, her book, White Fragility, has a wonderful metaphor of a bird cage. And what is myopy, right? So you're right up against the bird cage, so close that you don't see the cage. You see the bird, but you don't see the cage, right? You might back up a little bit and see one rung and you're like, oh, well, the bird can get around that, right? But the more you back up, maybe you just see the verticals, but then you back up even more and you see that there's this sort of um, web of oppression around this bird. Right, so the same thing um, can be true of any situation where you really need your mindfulness. You need this bigger context um, because of the way mindfulness works. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how mindfulness works. One way it works is, or the first way it works is that you run into a thorn bush, <laughs> right? You run into the thorn bush and you're like, oh, I did that again. I probably shouldn't be doing that, right? And then the next sort of stage of mindfulness is that you, um, you see the trigger and what caused you to run into the thorn bush and, and then maybe you walk around. Yard will be familiar with this. This is in Chula Das's book. It's very helpful. You kind of, you can walk around the thorn bush, but the thorn bush is still there, right? Um, and then the third is that maybe you're able to cut off the branches because you catch yourself a little bit farther back, right? Maybe your context, you're able to open up the context a little bit wider. Your lens is growing. And what happens is you're getting new information about a situation because often triggers are things that perhaps happen to us, happened to us when we were children, right? And they're, they're just this sort of automatic thing that keeps happening over and over again, given certain circumstances, right? But what happens is we're unable to see new information if we don't have that wide angle lens, right? So if you have that wide angle lens, you're, you're able to take in new information and you can begin to work with it at a deep subconscious level right? You're taking this in. You can actually reflect on what happened, right? And then your meditation practice really sort of begins to help you. This is where they, your outer worlds and inner worlds really begin to uh, weave together. Because as this work at a subconscious level is happening, you're beginning to rewire what's happening in your brain. And you can begin to take more active action that is wise when it happens again, right? You might begin to have small insights in your practice, um, maybe some big insights, right? And this is when we begin to, in a way, structurally be reconfigured in, in the subconscious. And then the big, uh, you know, and that's when you cut off the trunk of the, of the, of the thorn bush, right? Well, how do you get at the root? Well, this is where, um, certain awakening insights can begin to get at the root of things, right? These really huge insights that change your life completely. Um, so it's really good to be aware of those kind of, you know, steps that happen when you're really trying to work with something. So if there's a trigger, say, um, that is uh, uh, happening over and over again, you now have like these tools that you can um, begin to work with and begin to really change your life. It's, it's incredible. I'm sure many of you have already had those experiences, um, but if you happen and you're meditating and you're working with mindfulness, they're, they're gonna happen for you. So, um, the nuances that are revealed from your practice, the sort of ability to see the spectrum 
will really help you in taking wise action. This is why mindfulness and meditation are so helpful and that you can begin to see more clearly the relationships uh, between you and others, the relationship that you have with certain issues that are happening in your outer world, and you can begin to work with those. Um, one of the things I really like about some of the um, post-colonial and post-structural theories about gender and feminist um, feminism are that they think about creative ways of working around the binaries. Um, and, and I encourage you, if you're really interested in, in, in being creative that way, that you begin to look at some of those um, seminal texts by people like Foucault, people like, um, there's a, a man, um, Edward Soha, that I think teaches at UCLA in the, um, I think the urban design department, but he's worked with people like Bell Hooks and Cornell West um, and their ideas about what they call third space, right? Cultivating a kind of new terrain in which to, to, to move so that you're nimble, right? Because if you're stuck in a system that is so fixed you, and you can't move within that system, then you have to be creative about it, right? And you have to come up with these new sort of spaces. Sometimes it's called subaltern spaces. Um, I'll, I, I thought of an example in my own experience in meditation where I had to kind of come up with a third space <laughs> in order to manage and make progress. And it was the way I thought about the word and function of attention. Now, attention changes, the, the, the use of attention and what it means changes drastically as your meditation practice progresses and you move towards unity um, whether you're working with the absorptions or whether you're just working with a practice that's moving towards um, unification of the mind and awakening the function of attention changes drastically and i almost think that there should be more words to kind of describe it and some of you may have had that experience in your practice because there are no other words to describe attention and sometimes it can be really confusing when you're given instructions say you're doing an open awareness practice and you're told to pay attention to something. <laughs> it makes no sense whatsoever, right? And you may find other examples like that in your practice that um, would have um, a similar kind of need, right, of um, creativity. So if you're feeling like you're in a rut with something, and you find that you're beginning to see it in terms of binaries, that's, that's when you really need to be creative and to kind of um, think of uh, other spaces that can be created um, in order for you to move forward. Um, so I'd like to kind of look at this list of resources that I have as sort of interesting ways of looking um, at um, structural racism in my case that's what i'm really focusing on now but i'd also like to know if you have any questions or comments or offerings about um this these things that we've discussed i do mm -hmm. i have a couple questions um, i'm wondering if you um could share some specific examples of the ways in which you might think of, first of all, the way you, you may think about context. Mm -hmm. and, and then second of all, maybe about the, the uh, third space or sure. you know, it's just like maybe from your own life or just, you know, or a hypothetical example. Sure. Um, so context is, uh, I, when I think of context, I think of my awareness, if that makes sense. I think of uh, not 
consuming myself with one thing. One, I think the birdcage analogy is really good. And I also think my, um, I have this thing called the myopy mudra. Like if I'm having a conversation with all of you, we're sitting in a circle and I'm like focused like this on something and I can't even see you and I'm probably not even listening to what you're saying. I need to really widen that and really open it up so that I can hear you clearly. I'm not thinking of something else, right? Not thinking of just what I'm thinking of. I'm listening to what you're saying. Um, I can see you. I can see your body language. I can see the context within which we're having the discussion, whether it's, you know, at a Dharma center, whether it's um, on a Zoom. I mean, it's not hard to have my up on Zoom, I have to admit. <laughs> but um, but um, I think thinking about it spatially is really helpful. I mean, I have a background in architecture, so I find it really helpful. And I know that that doesn't always work for everybody. Um, uh, another example might be, you know, I'll give a real sort of adolescent trigger that I have whenever I'm with my mother and she tells me to brush my hair. It just triggers me immediately. I'm like, okay, so this is how it's going to be on this vacation. It just like completely taints my whole, without like looking at the big picture and realizing, okay, so she has causes and conditions too. She has habits that are hard to, to break and they're probably more difficult for her because she doesn't have any mindfulness or meditation practice or has uh, ever even thought about doing anything like that. You know, so it's like, and she probably doesn't even realize how, what it does to me unless I like explode or whatever, you know, which I don't do, but um, I have in the past, <laughs> you know, when I was maybe a teenager. So, you know, all of that is contextual, like time, space, um, who I'm with, what it was said, all of that can be taken into account, right? Uh, you might, let's take it into a bigger um, kind of um, space. Uh, okay, so I live in a condo, right, a, a, with a lot of units and have had uh, to uh, have discussions with the board of directors about issues in our unit and things like that. And if I'm not careful, I can really be triggered by their sort of unwillingness to help out or um, it, or really trying to work through the way they work, which I find extremely frustrating. So things like that, right? And you could take it even on a larger scale um, in politics, right? If there's something that really upsets me with politics, am I gonna let it ruin my day? Right? Or am I really going to put it into context and realize, well, there's nothing that I can do about this right now, you know? Um, and I think this goes to the heart of um, my interest in structural racism, too. It's like I am overwhelmed by things that are happening in our country relative to race. And I can be completely consumed by it and be really upset by it and get really angry by it. And it can flavor everything else that I do, regardless of whether it's directly with that or not. Or I can perhaps choose a more graceful uh, way of dealing with my anger and channel it into something that might actually help at a scale that I can manage, um, at a scale that, um, that I can manage, but that also might be really strategic and might actually make a difference ultimately, right? Does that help at all? So um, it's, it's looking beyond yourself, really. It's not just considering what you're feeling. It's considering what others are feeling. It's considering the modes within which the whatever it is is, you know, that is upsetting you. It's, um, it's really taking a step back and looking at that and then taking wise action, right? Versus just reacting. And I think um, 
was it Nils that did, and I haven't been able to watch his yet, his class that talked about responding versus reacting. So it really comes down to that. Yeah, it's really about responding versus reacting and responding with all of the information that you need, which includes the context largely. Um, and I'm sure he has some amazing things to say about it and I look forward to listening to it, but I haven't been able to yet. So it, that might help you as well if you didn't attend his class. And then the second was about third space. Third space is a little bit more difficult, but if I was going to put myself in a third, well, the attention um, example in my meditation practice, that was something that I'd noticed where I kind of had to create my own concept of how it was transforming. So, and I, again, I'm thinking about it spatially um, that that was able, that was able to, to sort of help me move through a rut that I was in. Right. Um, if I was going to take it into uh, like the ideas of um, dominant and subordinate groups, which um, Ruth King speaks about beautifully in her book, Mindful of Race. So we all have a dominant and subordinate group that we belong to, and we often relate more strongly to the subordinate group that we're in. So this is a really interesting thing to think about psychologically. We always relate strong, more strongly to the subordinate group we're in, right? So for me, I'm subordinate if I'm in a room full of um, men, right? Or I'm subordinate if I'm in a room full of young people, right? Because I'm getting old, right? So if I was going to create, and I find this to be um, particularly poignant relative to my art practice, so in a way, I have to kind of create my own space in the art world that includes uh, and feel and finds that what I do as an older white woman is relevant to contemporary art. I would have to create that. And I do feel like in a way I do create that in my own way where I can exercise my own interests and I can exercise my own um, path without being oppressed, right, by what I'm met with often in applying for grants or applying for, you know, and it gives you a sense of freedom. Does that help at all? It's extremely helpful because I've been okay. thinking a lot about just certain, um, just certain ways in, for, for example, ways in which my life choices maybe are not in line with say the values of my family and ways in which like i just sort of walk around with this like shame about that and it, that which it, it's not only bothersome to have that experience but like it bothers me that i have it in the first place you know because because like those values that i don't necessarily align with i don't agree with them anyways and so i really just thinking about this idea of like how can i how can i write some sort of a story that that's mine you know because i i often feel so like at the mercy of these other of these other values that even though they're not necessarily mine i feel it just feels so um um like bigger than me and so the idea of just and and I've re, and I've been thinking like okay so how could I really like you it just kind of named this thing that I've been really hungry for mm. oh I totally relate to that I think you'll love uh, reading some of Bell Hooks work and um, and of course you know hers is specific to um, black folks right but um, I think that it's very applicable and um, can be used in so many different ways uh, that are really helpful. Um, yeah, and um, the philosopher Lefebvre wrote a book called The Production of Space. So there's a whole vein of post-structuralism that deals with spatial constructs like um, and I'll just give you an example. This conversation we're having is creating a, a space, right? But we don't necessarily think that way, right? But it's a really um, 
beautiful way of thinking about things that you're producing space through your activities. Um, and they really focus on that idea. So you might really enjoy reading some of that because it was very profound for me to read, to read their work. Um, so name again, please. Uh, Lefebvre. L-E-F-E-B-R-E -E -E, wrote a book called The Production of Space. Um, and, but I think more accessible for, for everybody is Bell Hook's work. She's a storyteller. And um, if you uh, look up Third Space or Subaltern, uh, you'll probably find some things. And I'll try to add some of her work. I didn't have time to add it to this list because I think it's all very applicable to so many things. I found myself doing the same thing relative to my family, and I think a lot of people do. I think that's what happens during our teenage years is that we're actually creating third space in some way, and it really depends on you and your social um, network. Um, I was uh, an introvert, you know, so I really had to create my own space in order to feel valid and relevant. Um, and maybe the way I did it wasn't so great, thinking back on it, but it worked. <laughs> I certainly created my own space. <laughs> so anyway, it's a really interesting way of thinking. So um, I'm glad that was helpful for you. Any, anybody else? Okay, well, let's just look at some of these awesome things that um, I've come across recently um, and not so recently. Um, so if you scroll down beyond the spectrums, um, there's Ruth, Ruth King's book, and of course she has a wonderful uh, website called Mo the Mindful of Race Institute. She too does trainings, Robin D'Angelo does trainings. It would be, gosh, it would be incredible. I know they're probably really expensive, but to get one of these people in um, to the Dharma Collective. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're pretty amazing. And Ruth King is in the um, Black and Buddhist in America Symposium, as well as other people that you might know. Um, Reverend Kyoto Jackson, I think is her name, and the man she, and I can't remember his name. Uh, they're um, from a Zen tradition, and they just wrote a book as well that I think is about inclusivity, not necessarily specifically about race, um, but it was really interesting to watch that symposium, it's wonderful. There are two different panels. Panavati is one of them, and I think she's one of the only black nuns in the Theravada tradition. So some pretty amazing people there. Um, and then uh, there is Analia's Satipatthana Guide, which is fantastic. And then I have a visual synopsis of it, which some people find helpful, and there's a link to it there. Um, Robin D'Angelo's book is White Fragility, which is every white person should read it. I think it's also of interest to people of color to kind of understand where they are relative to um, white people and their um, often, um, dare I say, ignorance of structural racism. It's pretty awesome. Um, and she has a great list that I don't think we'll have time to actually go to, but I'll just tell you generally. Somebody else maintains it, um, but she adds things to it, um, but it's linked through her website and this just links directly to it. Um, it's primarily like three groups of things and maybe a, a smattering of other things, but you know, write your legislators about things like prison reform, bail reform, awesome thing to do. We have a big prop on our November election that is relative to bail reform, which I think two years ago was voted to get rid of it in the legislation. And then there were enough signatures, they're in opposition to it. There's a vote on it. Both sides have valid arguments. Check it out. There's a lot of really interesting articles on that. Um, another thing is to join a race affinity group. And Ruth King talks a lot about those in her book. Uh, race affinity groups. It's hard to talk about race when you're in a mixed group. It's much better to be with your own race um, for many reasons. And she goes through all the reasons. They all make sense. Um, so check that out. So that's another thing. Another one is to create um, book clubs that focus on work by people of color. 
right? Really, you know, read the stories, read um, their theories, read their opinions. It's really eye-opening and just, it'll open your context up, right? And this is what you need in order to take wise action. Tana Hasi Coates book is just unbelievable. Um, the case for reparations in the Atlantic is also amazing. His book talks about black bodies and fear and how it's really the black body at stake and that he, he never felt like he had agency over his body. It was a really profound piece of work. Um, read it. And it's written as a letter to his 15 year old son. It's quite beautiful. The case for reparations is about how the Federal Housing Administration basically redlined um, mortgages for people of, or blacks in particular. Um, and I don't know if people of color have also experienced this, it's possible, but I think African Americans in, in particular were affected by this. Um, his is focused on a particular family and he follows them from Mississippi to Chicago. And the whole um, contract buying situation, which is unbelievable. People were making so much money off of them and they weren't really mortgages, but they had all of the responsibility for the mortgages. It's just, I just can't believe this stuff happens, it's crazy. And then there's a wonderful interview with him, with Terry Gross on Fresh Air, that links to that. Here's that wonderful symposium, Black and Buddhist in America. Um, Brian Stevenson, who is an attorney and his um, talk about the need for injustice. And he has this really awesome story where he evidently works primarily with um, uh, minors who are treated as adults in our justice system. And at one point he was working on a case and he wrote to the judge, he was really upset and angry and he wrote to the judge, he goes, well, how about instead of treating um, my client as, you know, uh, an adult, we more specifically treat him as a 75 year old white man of privilege with lots of money see what happens <laughs> so but he has some great suggestions about how you can get involved and you know, write your legislators about prison reform um, which is needed greatly here is uh, Marilyn Fry's birdcage metaphor in image and a very abbreviated form and it's really uh, it was written um, about uh, primarily the oppression of women and feminist theory. So here's the article if you're interested in reading the whole article. It's very interesting as well. Um, but this analogy is, I think, perfectly suited for many situations. Um, so just when you didn't think that racism could be even more embedded in our um, institutions, Dorothy Roberts talks about race-based medicine. TED Talk very and and these are short right so they don't take long to listen to and they're it's profound and insane the american anthropological association's understanding race website is amazing um get to know your black history it's an interactive timeline it's incredible all this information about human variation and you know lived experience it's, it's just fantastic so it's a very um full experience going there David Eckerd talking about a story of his son coming home, telling him about what he learned about Rosa Parks. And he learned that Rosa Parks was an elderly woman and that she was tired and that she just sat in the first chair that was available on the bus. And that's what he was taught in school and what he did about that because she was 42 years old she had been sitting at a sewing machine all day and she was tired of racism. She wasn't tired from being exhausted and on her feet all day. So unbelievable. <laughs> um, and then because I'm an artist, I love um, art and I love um, understanding the world through artists' eyes. And so one of my favorite artists of all time is Carrie James Marshall. 
and this is a very brief talk on Art 21 about museums, and his paintings are absolutely unbelievable. Um, he's incredible. And then Kara Walker, also just a powerhouse, uh, very difficult work to see and to understand, and here's a wonderful interview with her. And then a recent, pretty recent work by Kara Springer in Canada, White People Do Something. And if you look at all this other stuff, that'll make so much sense to you. <laughs> you know, um, it's just amazing. And then Keith Washington was one of my professors in grad school. And I took a class from him called Flesh Tones. He's an African American artist. His work is incredible. He came into the first class with a band aid on his face. And of course, it was the color of my skin, not his right there just like boom you know uh insidious racism is you know it's just unbelievable so um he this painting right here is um i'm sure of one of the lynching sites he does these just absolutely gorgeous paintings of lynching sites so how do you how do you resolve that <laughs> right the beauty of a lynching site, it's really interesting. So um, his and other portraits that he, that he does are just incredible. So just a smattering, I'll be adding to this. I'm gonna keep this link on my website, so feel free. It's under the meditation heading. Um, I'll be adding to it often. So please, please um, look at it if you are interested. I hope it helps broaden your viewpoint if this is something you're interested in. Um, and I'd like to ask if there are any other questions. And if not, gnomes coming and going there. <laughs> um, I would just like to close with one line, a short meditation, one line from Ruth King's Meditation on Equanimity. We don't have time to do the whole thing, it's, but it's quite beautiful. And it is in her Mindful of Race book. So I recommend that you uh, see that, um, read it, enjoy it. She's amazing. So go ahead and just close your eyes for a moment and contemplate the statement, may I see the world with quiet eyes. Namaste, everybody. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. And um, I hope you have a beautiful week.